the Republican Whip. Mr. President, later today we expect the Democrat leader to force a vote on undermining the filibuster in hopes of forcing through a federal election takeover to give his party an advantage in future elections. And make no mistake about it, that is what we are talking about, federalizing elections in this country, usurping, preempting states where elections have been administered and regulated since the inception of this country. And the method, the method that you're talking about using to do it will lit literally undermine and blow up everything the Senate was, was supposed to be. Now, you can say that the filibuster is used to prevent or block things from happening, and that may be true. You have done it. We have done it. Use a 60-vote threshold last week to stop a bipartisan Russia sanctions bill from passing in the United States Senate. Both sides have done it. But the filibuster is representative and symbolic of something much larger. And that is the very essence of what the Senate is about. I want to read for you from the Federalist Papers because there's been a lot of quoting of the Founding Fathers over here today. This is what the author of Federalist 62 notes, and I quote, a Senate as a second branch of the Legislative Assembly distinct from and dividing power with a first must be in all cases a salutary check on the government. It doubles the security to the people by requiring the concurrence of two distinct bodies in schemes of usurpation and perfidy. Secondly, the necessity of a Senate is not less indicated by the propensity of all single and numerous assemblies to yield to the impulse of sudden and violent passions and to be seduced by factious leaders into intemperate and pernicious resolutions. Go on, the author of Federalist 62. A continual change, even of good measures, is inconsistent with every rule of prudence and every prospect of success. In the first place, it forfeits the respect and confidence of other nations and all the advantages connected with national character. The internal effects of immutable policy are still more calamitous. It poisons the blessing of liberty itself. It will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood if they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant, incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. Law is defined to be a rule of action, but how can that be a rule which is little known and less fixed? Ladies and gentlemen, our founders created this institution to be separate and distinct from the House of Representatives for a reason. And what you're talking about doing today is turning the United States Senate into a majoritarian body. No different. No different from the House of Representatives, except with longer terms, and some people would argue bigger egos. That's what we're talking about doing. They won't need us. Yeah, we have longer terms. They're staggered. But the essence of the Senate is a check and balance on the passions of the other body. And there's a reason why the founders created it. Now, Mr. President, I represent a red state, South Dakota. I am not a racist, nor are the people who I know in the state of South Dakota. And our state legislature, like most states' legislatures, pretty much every year comes up with ideas. Some of them, a few of them, not most, but a few get enacted into law, but a lot of them end on the cutting room floor, which is where most legislative ideas end up. And there are some crazy ones. I would argue we have some crazy ones coming out of here. There are some pretty crazy bills that get introduced around here, most of which gladly never make it into law. But in South Dakota, our legislature meets every year, like most legislatures, introduces a bunch of bills, acts on them, conducts hearings, 
moves them through the legislative process, some become enacted and signed into law, most don't. One of the bills that did get signed into law was a bill that created a photo ID to vote. It was passed in 2003. It's worked well in South Dakota. People support it, not just in South Dakota, but across the country. And after it passed in 2003, the 2004 election was the largest turnout in modern history, at least for the years which we have that kind of information available. 78.6% of people voted in the 2004 election. After, after in 2003, the South Dakota legislature passed a photo ID law. Now, I think there are some, some ideas out there that are pretty bad. And I'm not one who is here to say that, and to dispute the 2020 election. The 2020 election is over. It's been decided. It was the largest turnout since 1900. Largest turnout in 120 years, which is why you all are arguing these states are going in and changing things to prevent high turnout. Well, most of the states that I've seen, at least, that I can tell, the legislation that I've looked at that has been passed and enacted are things that I think in most cases people would say, well, yeah, that's probably in the purview of the state legislature. State of Georgia, for example, in terms of days in which you can early vote, has, actually has more early voting, more early voting, more permissive early voting than the state of New York or the state of Delaware, the president's home state. No excuse absentee voting. We have that in South Dakota. We have a long period for absentee voting or early voting in South Dakota, much longer than what we're talking about here. A red state. State legislature decided that, thought it made sense. But no excuse absentee voting, something we do in South Dakota, something that's allowed for in Georgia, but not in the state of New York or the state of Delaware, because the state's decided, as it should be. How about standing in line, giving people things while they're standing in line to vote? The state of South Dakota has a law against that, too. It's called electioneering. It's called electioneering. Now, there isn't anything that I understand in the Georgia law that doesn't prevent an election worker from going out and giving somebody a glass of water or something to eat. There isn't anything that says that 150 feet away, which is 50 yards, 50 yards away, you can't feed people lunch. All it says is when somebody's standing in line that political operatives shouldn't be electioneering, going out and handing things out to induce people to vote a certain way. Ladies and gentlemen, don't blow up the United States Senate and everything that the founders intended the Senate to be about over an issue that for all intents and purposes, and you can say it's not, but it is federalizing our elections. It is taking power away from states to make the laws that govern their elections. And thank God in 2020 the states did things the right way. The state certified on time, in accordance with the law, the 2020 election. And if we hadn't had that, if we had sucked all that power up here to Washington, D.C. and centralized our elections, what do you think would have happened? I mean, I think there's a reason why we have a decentralized system, and I think it makes sense for a country as big as ours, particularly at a time when we're worried about other countries hacking our elections. It's a lot harder to hack 50 states than it is one computer system here in Washington, D.C. But that's what we're talking about. And, 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 and you can't sugarcoat it. You can disguise it. And you can say it's Jim Crow 2.0 and all that. But it is federalizing elections in this country and taking power directly away from the states. I lost my first Senate election back in 2002. I was ahead. On Wednesday morning, Tuesday night went and came and went. On Wednesday morning, I was sitting in my living room in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 
watching the television, and I watched my 3,300 vote lead become a 524 vote deficit like that. Because one precinct came in from one of the reservation counties in South Dakota, and they voted 94 percent, 93 percent against me. And I lost that election. And I had all these people, all these smart political minds around the country in South Dakota saying, you got to contest it. There are irregularities. You know there are irregularities. And I thought about it, and we did a little bit of looking into it, but a day later I decided to say the election was over. I lost that first election. And you know what? That's what happens. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. What you all are trying to do here is create a system, seems to me at least, where you give your side a permanent advantage. And I don't, I mean, that's your prerogative. If you want to do this, that's fine in terms of having the issue and talking about it. But the one thing I just fundamentally disagree with is how you're proposing to do it. To literally do away with everything the Senate was designed and created to be by our founders and has served a purpose very, very well, and you all did it. The last session of Congress, you, you filibustered numerous coronavirus bills. You filibustered police reform. You filibustered pro-life legislation. And that can go down the list. And like I said, you used the 60-vote threshold last week to keep a Russia sanctions bill, a bipartisan Russia sanctions bill, I might add, from passing in the Senate. And you can go on and look at all the statements you've all made through the years, and I'm not going to repeat them because you've heard them over and over again, but I think it's important to remember one thing, and that is that when you make statements like that, they do have a shelf life. And some of those, that shelf life is pretty short because it was just a few years ago. Some cases three, four years ago. Some cases one year ago, two years ago. A lot of you have statements publicly, clearly out there, defending the filibuster, doing away with it would be doomsday for democracy. Turn America into a banana republic. Don't do it. I'm just saying don't do it. You gotta, you gotta be some of you over there who get this and who, are, who gotta be I mean, we, you know, we had the pressure to do this. You know that. 34 times. Our president in the last administration, 34 times, tweeted publicly, demanded that Republicans get rid of the filibuster. And we resisted it. And I've had people in the media ask me, well, and I've heard that your side is saying, too, well, the, the Democrats, you know, if we don't do it now, the Republicans will do it. No, we're not going to do it. Not if you don't. If you do, sure, then it's all bets are off. And then the Senate becomes the House of Representatives and policy changes every two years or every four years depending on who's in power. And there's no stability, there's no predictability, there's no moderation, and there's no incentive for this body to work together across the aisle. That's changed permanently. I hope that doesn't happen. Because I don't think that's what we should be about. Certainly not what we should be about. But that's where this is headed, if, if, if you move forward. And if you change the rules, overthrow, overthrow the rules to do this. Mr. President, we are better than this. Our country is better than this. Our founders created a system that was designed to provide that moderation, to provide that continuity, to provide that stability, to provide that predictability in a way that what is being talked about today would completely destroy and undermine not only in the near term but permanently. Because you can't do this once. You can't turn this off. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Once you do this, it's the new state of play in the United States Senate. And that's a whole new world. Not just for us, for the people we represent, for our nation and for the world. 
I hope and pray that uh, there are enough wise Democrats on your side that will join with all of us to resist the pressure that you're feeling like we did when our president came to us and said, you got to do this. We aren't going to do it because we understand what it means. And you should too. Thank you, Mr. President.